Hello, everyone. My name is Arshad Kudroli. I am going to describe to you the work that we have been doing in my lab on biolocomotion in soft sediments. Um, such sediments can be found at the bottom of water bodies, like the bottom of lakes, rivers, um, coastal estuaries, for example, or even at the bottom of ocean. Right? Um, the work I'm going to describe to you has been mostly uh, done in collaboration with Bernie Ramirez, who was an undergraduate student in my group. And now he's a, he's a graduate student in NYU. And more recently, Brian Chang has joined as a postdoctoral researcher in the group, and he's, he's also contributing to this research. Uh, in particular today, I'm gonna focus on a particular kind of worm, uh, California black worm or Lumbricus vergaris, which is found very commonly in this case. Um, a, a picture of that is on the left there. And I'm gonna to describe to you the various strokes that it uses to move forward in granular materials or in water itself. Now, locomotion in some sense in the benthic layer, which is uh, basically at the bottom of uh, the ocean or water bodies um, is uh, all across the planet. Uh, you can see example of uh, octopus, uh, burrowing into the soil or into the sandy bottom there very easily. Or you can see uh, sharks, for example, or uh, the Pacific land uh, lands, uh, excuse me, Pacific sand lands in this case, diving into the sand very frequently. Uh, but these uh, systems are, or these organisms are very complicated. And what we are going to do is we are going to focus on limbless uh, worms, in this case, to examine how they burrow through sand or granular material. Uh, in this case, understand how they uh, move in this granular materials versus moving in water itself, right? What are the contrasting uh, strokes that they might use? How do they move in this case uh, in the two uh, mediums? Um, uh, and the, the way we are going to move forward in this is by using transparent sign. So one of the drawbacks with granular materials is that uh, when something moves in there or earthworm moves in there, you can't see it very easily. And so we have circumvented that problem by using um, granular hydrogels in this case. So over here, you can see a, a little Petri dish where we have swollen, if you like, or hydrated hydrogels. They look just like glass beads in this case. They're a little bit more slippery than glass beads in this case. And if you put them in water, as in this, uh, in this picture over here, then you can see through them. And so in this case, Lumbricus vergaris or this California black worm is, is inside it and you can locate its entire body shape and see what stroke it from forms as it moves through the lead. All right, so uh, what we do in this case is that uh, thanks to the fact that uh, this worm can be seen through this material, we put it inside a box, we use a quasi two dimensional system, for example. So um, a, a, a Healy Shaw, for example, in this case, where one dimension is a bit smaller so that we can constrain the motion of the worm to uh, two dimensions um, while it's uh, free to use whatever stroke it prefers. But in this case, we can visualize the dynamics more easily than tracking in three dimensions. Um, and we have also done the three-dimensional motion as well to verify that what we are going to discuss here is in fact what is observed even as it moves through a full three-dimensional container. All right. So as we watched a few times, this worm on the right here is has burrowed from the, the top where it was dropped initially, burrowed to the bottom, investigated, if you like, all four corners of the cell and risen to the top. Right. So the question is what or how does it move in this case? And to do that, we have tracked the shape of the worm over time. So here, time goes from blue to red, or excuse me, from red to blue in this case. And so you can see that initially uh, the worm in that movie uh, moved back and forth um, on the surface, then dived down, reached one corner, crawled across to the other, other side, and then rose back up and, and it essentially laps back and forth, right? So when you look at it with, uh, in greater detail, if you zoom into one particular region, and if you examine in this case, what is happening as it's moving through the sediments, which you can't see, it's transparent. You can only see the, the worm in this case or the track of the worm in this case. 
what you observe is that the, the worm as it moves forward goes through what looks like a narrow path. In this case, it seems to essentially follow its own body as it moves through, as it burrows through the sediment. Whereas if you focus on the worm's body when it's outside the sediments or above the sediments in the water above, you can see that it appears to flop around or, or, or move around um, as it moves a lot more. So that, if you like, directly seems to be a difference between how the um, black worm in this case moves in sediments versus in water. So that is in the lab frame of reference. But what you can do is you can go um, to the worm frame of reference in this case. So in the worm frame of reference, uh, you're taking um, sort of the tracking in this case, moving to the center of mass of the worm, and then orienting the axis, the x-axis towards the head, all right? So as the worm moves around, you can examine what its body is doing as a function of time. In this case, what we observe on the left in the sediments is that, well, uh, you can see that it is doing undulations. Its length is increasing and contracting as uh, given by the black and brown uh, color scheme over there. And as it does that, you can see um, uh, sort of traveling waves going across its body from the head to the tail. If you look at what happens in the case of water, it also appears to be similar, although the stroke seems to be a little bit freer at the end where the head and the tail appears to whip around a little bit more than compared to the sediments. Now that makes sense because sediments, again, resist the motion of the worm a little bit more. If you drag your hand through the sediments, you can feel that drag a lot more in this case than in water. And so, um, you know, how does this impact how this worm moves. So to um, quantify that, we have um, examined in this case the displacement as a function of time. So this is, if you like, in the body frame of reference. So even as it turns and so on, we can measure, in this case, the cumulative displacement towards its head or as it moves back or as it moves to the left or to the right. So the, the panel on the left here captures what is the displacement along its body towards its head or towards its tail. And the panel in the, in the center is, if you like, uh, or excuse me, in, in, um, in, the, in the center is, is what happens uh, in water. Okay, so the, excuse me. So in the first panel, it's in the sediments and the second panel, it's in water. Um, and in this case, what you see in blue there is the motion in this case, as it moves in the panel direction or towards um, uh, towards its head or towards its tail. And you can see that it essentially appears to be moving with a constant speed as it moves along. And most of the motion is towards its head in this case, and very little lateral motion can be observed when it's moving through this sediment. By contrast, in water, it does move along a lot uh, along its head, but also it appears to slide around a little bit more in comparison uh, in the case of water. But most of the motion, if you track it for much longer, tends to be essentially towards the head. So in that sense, it seems to be essentially a directed a random walker as it's seeking its way out as best, if you like, through this cell. So then using uh, many time trials, we have measured the speed with which the worm travels in this case as a function of various worms that we have. So we, we had a collection of about 35 worms in this case, we picked out them uh, pick them out at random from a container, and we, uh, if you like, uh, let them loose in this case inside the container and watch them move around. And in this case, uh, uh, here on the right is in a panel, we have uh, example speeds that we measured as a function of the length of the worm, right? So the length of the worms we found varied um, anywhere between a centimeter to uh, 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 about four to five centimeters in this case. So we took our idea of them, and when we uh, we measure that, what you find is a lot of variation between uh, the worms. Um, in this case, uh, dependent uh, on a little bit on um, individuals, but also at the time of the day, for example. So we did a whole lot of trials, but nonetheless, you can see that in this case, in the sediments, they seem to be moving faster than the case of water. 
a lot of variation again from worm to worm. So we had to do a whole lot of different trials to get this right. Um, so in this case, what we did again for, um, as I, I described to you a little bit earlier, um, uh, we um, use the body frame of reference and the lab frame of reference to analyze our system more deeply. So in this case, uh, here's an example of a track that we have done uh, in this case here, the shape of a worm, for example, the head is marked there, the tail which has been, uh, uh, which has been found is marked there as well, and the center of mass. And in this case, what we can do is find out the amplitude in this um, body frame of reference of the, um, of the worm. And so uh, what, uh, what we have done in this case is look at the square and the roots mean square of the amplitude uh, in this case as a function of the length of the worm. And as the worm gets longer or bigger, the more fluctuations are observed. So there we found that correlation. Not only that, we see that in case of water, for example, it, the worm fluctuation or the body of the, fluct of the worm fluctuates a little bit more, undulates a little bit more than in sediments. Okay, it's a little bit more freer to move if you like. But other than that, uh, there's not much of a qualitative difference between the shape of the um, undulations in the two systems. So now what you can do is look at these uh, amplitudes of fluctuation of the worm as it moves back and forth. Um, and plot that as a function of time. So as uh, a worm uh, undulates in this case, the total amplitude in this case is going to oscillate. And that's what you observe. The period here you can see is about 10 to 20 seconds in this case. It's almost periodic, but not quite. And so in this case, what we do is we do a self-correlation or autocorrelation in this case over time. And then we can identify the main frequency in this case, which is marked here. In, it by the peaks uh, or the, the arrows in this case for sediments and water. So we did find in this example that the sediments, uh, the, the, the worm is moving a bit faster uh, or and, and undulating a bit faster in this case, whereas in water, it's also undulating, but uh, with a slightly different speed, okay? All right, so then uh, with that, so this is like characterizing the undulation of the uh, worm. What we can then get at is if you like, well, is, is what's the Reynolds number in this case for the system as this worm moves um, in the sediments and in water versus the swimming number, okay? The swimming number is essentially the speed with which the, ample, uh, the, the worm itself moves sideways um, as opposed to moving forward, okay? So that the definition is given there if you like to follow up on that. All right, so in this case, what you find is the data is, uh, if, if you like, organize itself into two parts there, um, in, uh, and, and in this case, perhaps you can describe it by a straight line. Okay. So then we started to delve into that question a little bit more deeper, deeply, and in this case, we ask, well, if you are imagining in this case that you have this uh, undulating swimmer in this case, uh, which is moving forward, as you know, in those cases, the, the reason why an object of this kind moves is if you imagine it's a section of the tail up there, uh, is or, or the body is a rod, then the drag needed um, uh, or the drag experience when you're moving perpendicular to the body versus parallel to the body is different, which gives you a net propulsive force. Uh, when, once you saw that, uh, this has been done um, first by light hill, for example, and, and many others uh, uh, before and since then uh, in more detail. And in this case, um, the, uh, the swimming or the undulation speed in this case turns out to be proportional to how anisotropic this drag is related to one. So if there was no anisotropy to the drag, then there would be no swimming, but the greater the anisotropy are captured by CR in this case, then the faster one would swim. Okay. So if you put in the nominal value for water, for example, which is two, in this case, you can capture um, the undulation uh, speed or uh, the speed due, uh, of swimming due to undulation as a function of what the worm is actually observed to do. And in this case, uh, for these trials that we have shown here, the data does organize itself around a slope of one. In other words, um, you know, within all the approximations, it turns out that the undulation speed um, ca uh, calculated by Lytle, for example, in this case, does capture the speed with which worms swim in water. Okay. But then um, what happens in the sediment? In the sediment, uh, well, not much is known. Um, you know, what is the drag ratio, for example, of a rod 
uh, in this case. So one has to measure it and we did that. So in this case, we took a rod and we measured it as it was being dragged through uh, the same medium, uh, parallel to the body, if you like, and perpendicular to the body. And uh, you can see in this case um, um, that the drag is much greater than being dragged uh, perpendicular to the axis in this case versus parallel to the axis. So once you do that, and we also uh, did experiments as a function of depth, what we found was there was a weak dependence on depth, but nonetheless, the drag anisotropy was always greater than for water. And in this case, uh, it varied between five and seven as we varied uh, the depth from five centimeters to 11 centimeters, which is roughly where our, our experiment was being done. All right, so in this case, the drag anisotropy turned out to be six. Okay, so then uh, using this and using also the effective drag in this case um, and back calculating the effective viscosity, we were able to use that and estimate the, uh, the Reynolds number that we had, um, which I've sort of uh, shown you very quickly over here. Okay. So then using those, uh, the drag and isotropy in this case, we can calculate the swimming speed. And in this case, the swimming speed versus the actual observed speed is plotted here. And what you find is that, well, the data lake looks much more scattered than in case of water. Not only that, the slopes don't quite agree. So we get a slope of about 50%. So in some sense, the calculated speed appears to capture only 50% of the speed with which the worm is actually observed. So how do you, um, you know, uh, so you can say, well, this is a glass half full, or you can say, well, uh, where does the other 50% come from? Where do these fluctuations come from? So to understand that, um, you know, I remind you that uh, I, I alluded to the fact that these worms appear to stretch, elongate, and contract as they are moving. And here's a short video of precisely that. So this is a worm which is just shown actually, in fact, just in water in this case. And even, uh, even in water in this case, you can see it elongate and contract. We can track the shape of the worm and show that in this case, the length of the worm is in fact changing here in this example from about um, you know, 22 uh, millimeters to about 30 or 35 uh, millimeters in this case, right? So as much as 20% in the sediments and similar motion as well in water. So uh, the worm in this case appears to undulate um, as it moves, but also elongates and contracts in both mediums as it moves. So then um, there's another fact that if you zoom in to the, uh, to the uh, surface of the, of the worm body in this case, you can see hook-like structures in this case, all right? And in this case, uh, these, um, th the, this picture is, uh, is borrowed from a, a, a paper here um, where uh, these are deployed or used, uh, this chate, if you like, um, are used to grab onto the material and propel the worm ball. So then using that and, and uh, using that fact, what we kind of developed was a dynamic anchor model. So you can imagine in this case that, okay, the, bo the body of the worm is contracting and elongating over time. And so let's just represent that in terms of two beads connected by a spring, All right? So in this case, the head moves forward by stretching the body. The back is anchored using perhaps these chattes, for example. Um, into, the, into the sediment or by even turning the body to grab onto the material a little bit more. Then in the second half of the cycle, the head is anchored in this case and the tail move forward. So this kind of harmon harmonica motion, if you like, um, or, um, and, and using these uh, dynamic anchors here makes the worm in this case propel forward. And you can calculate what is this sort of peristaltic right, motion um, in this case. And you can calculate the speed as a function of the how many uh, contraction expansion cycles there are. You can also put in, all right, uh, in this case, well, the anchoring may not be perfect. All right, so you can put in a factor for that. And in this case, uh, alpha here captures that parameter. And for sake of um, simplicity, we'll say that, well, the anchoring is perfect in the case of sediments, all right, um, and zero or, or it will always slip in water, for example, where there's nothing to really grab onto. The drag because of these tiny chattes is not simply enough to change the uh, drag experience by the worm body. Okay. So when you do that, 
uh, we then go back and ask, well, what is the uh, frequency which with these worms uh, expand and contract? Again, we can use the autocorrelation function to grab um, the when uh, these peaks occur and how is it correlated to the correlation in the velocity itself when it moves back and forth. And in this case, you see that in the case of the sediment, uh, there is a peak uh, in this case at uh, the half cycle uh, of the of the expansion ex contraction cycle, which corresponds to the fact that it moves or the worm moves in two steps, one during the contraction phase and once during the expansion phase. So in this case, uh, that's what we observe in the sediments, but when you turn uh, to the water, what you observe in this case is there is a peak in this case, and what that corresponds to is that the worm moves forward in one cycle as it contracts, but as it expands, it moves backward uh, in the peristaltic stroke. So in, a, in other words, in water, the peristaltic stroke doesn't contribute to its net, net motion, all right? So uh, using that, we can calculate what is the contribution of this peristaltic motion or the peristaltic stroke to the observed speed. And in this case, again, the data organizes itself along uh, a, a line with some scatter. Um, but in this case, the scatter um, um, or excuse me, slope is also about 50%, right? So in other words, the peristaltic motion in this case seems to again capture about 50% of the motion of the worm, all right? So I remind you in the previous, half or in the first, first half uh, of, of, of this here, we were looking at the um, um, undulation motion. In this case, we're looking at peristaltic. So we had roughly 50% there, roughly 50% here. So what we then did was combine that, all right? So in other words, we just used superposition and said, well, the worm could be moving because of the undulatory stroke as well as the per peristaltic stroke. So let's add up those contributions for each worm example that we have studied. And in this case on the left um, is the data that I was uh, showing you already. Um, and in this case, uh, you know, in black triangles are the sediment data and in circles are the uh, blue circles are, is the water data. And now you can see that, well, um, here's a slope one in this case and over many orders of magnitude, the data is well prescribed by this simple superposition idea of two strokes, the undulation and the peristaltic motion contributing to the, uh, the speed of the worm. Okay. So we didn't stop there. Uh, we then uh, worked, uh, worked uh, uh, further and we looked at when the worm is at different altitudes or different compression in this case uh, under the, under the, uh, under the uh, sediment. So when they are right near the surface, if you like, we also switched worms. We looked at the other example, which Bernie uh, was showing you in the first slide there itself, uh, the composting work or uh, Ifendinda in this case. And we measured in that case as well, the, um, the speed due to undulation and peristaltic motion. The relative contributions are a little bit different in that case. Uh, uh, it's a slightly different mix if you like, uh, but nonetheless, when you add them up, you find that the data again falls on the slope one. In other words, just combining this undulation and peristaltic motion, these worms are able to move um, in sediments as well as in water. And in the case of sediments, they're able to use both strokes to move themselves faster through the material. Whereas in water, only the undulation of the transverse motion of the worm comes into play as it moves forward. Okay, so um, in conclusion, I would say that um, in this, uh, we have, what we have shown you is a couple of different examples of worms which crawl through, um, the wor um, through water uh, saturated granular material in this case. They find um, they can live that fair fine. Um, and in this case, they, we find that uh, they can move using two strokes. One is the peristaltic motion, elongation and contraction of the body. And the other is the undulation of the transverse motion of the body. In case of sediments, both these strokes come into play to propel the worm forward. But in the case of water, which is slippery, uh, in this case, um, the motion or, or these two motions of the body still exist. The two stro strokes of the worm still exist, but it's only the contribution of the transverse motion which uh, makes the worm move forward. Um, so with that, um, I um, again um, 
draw your attention to a couple of preprints here, or excuse me, um, papers that we have written uh, in the uh, in the la over the last year. And also, I want to draw attention to the other speaker, uh, another uh, talk that will be given by Trin Huang from my group, uh, where he has applied what we have learned in this case from these worms to developing uh, a magnet uh, and an elastomer-based uh, robot, soft robot, and uh, and uh, the, he shows very interesting dynamics in that case as well, depending on if it is moving through sediments or in water. 